There's some chip and ring, but we can get started. Let the record reflect. We've reconvened with all members present. Uh, Councilwoman Deb Cohen is absolutely excused. For those who are able, I invite you to join us to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And re please remain standing after the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing as we remember a few longtime Madison residents we lost over the last few weeks. Marilyn Frasoli, longtime Madison resident, died yesterday, age of 78, born in East Orange. 1945, graduated of East Orange Catholic High School in class of 63, married her beloved husband Severio on September 23, 1972, and the couple settled right here in Madison where they raised their son. Before retiring, Marilyn had a long career as bookkeeper with ARA -R -A Food Service in local school districts. She's survived by her husband of 50 years and one son, Nicholas, and two cherished uh, grandchildren. Felice Bacola, longtime Madison resident, passed away on March 18th, age of 92, survived by his wife of 50 years, Rosa, and along with his children, Anthony, Immaculata, Salvatore, and Valerie, and their respective spouses, plus 10 grandchildren and three great grandchildren. He was preceded in death by his first wife, Antonetta, and his son, Archie. Elise was born in Italy in December 16, 1930, came to America when he was 20 years old with his bride, Antonetta. They settled in Madison and began, as he began taking the bus every day to Lionel Trains in Irvington. Antonetta lost a leg in Italy at age 12 with a German bomb, braved life and motherhood, but eventually succumbed to illnesses, losing her life just before age 39. A few years later, Felice met Rosa while on vacation in Italy, and they married. And then we'll also remember Carol List passed away unexpectedly March 14th, age of 81. Born in Philadelphia, lived with her parents and siblings in the area before moving to Montclair. And graduated from Sargent College of Boston University in 1963 with a BS in physical therapy. She worked for a hospital, several, several different physicians doing uh, rehab and sports medicine after retiring. Carol worked for a fabric store for 10 years where her specialty was design and production of custom window treatments. She also ran a Curves franchise for five years. Carol and her husband Bill, who is a longtime Madison volunteer, lived in Madison for 52 years where they raised their sons, er Andrew, Eric, and Peter. She was also PTA president at Lucy DeAnthony Elementary School, and they had just recently moved to Lantern Hill in New Providence. And again, she is survived by her husband 58 years and her three sons. Let's take a moment to remember Marilyn Fasoli, Felice Piccolo, and Carolyn List. And let's pass our thoughts on to the families and friends that they leave behind. Thank you. And we had no executive meeting at our last meeting, so there are no minutes to approve. Can I have a motion for the regular minutes of March 13th, 2023? So moved. Second. Any discussion or corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome all. Again, I apologize for our delay. Not having an executive meeting at the last meeting has its consequences, I guess. I mean, we went a little, a little long today. Um, but uh, a few things to update on. Uh, at our last meeting, I did mention the uh, our Drew Forest update that um, we were hoping to meet directly with U Drew University Board of Trustees. And I'm happy to announce that they, we have a meeting scheduled for this week with administration and representatives from the board. So we appreciate that their quick response. And we hope that this di dialogue will quickly lead to an agreement to preserve the forest. And on Saturday, Council President John Hoover and Councilman Bob Landrigan and I attended the Wind of the Spirit Domestic uh, Workers Program graduation. 
uh, with the theme, We Make History. The program trained domestic workers on their rights while providing them the tools they need to be successful as domestic workers and new immigrants. It was an honor for us to attend, and, and the graduates were so proud of the certificates they received and the recognitions. And we have some of the representatives from Wind of Spirit here tonight. So thank you for the work you do and making it easier in the difficult life of moving into a new country. And today, through the work of Michael Pellessier, we had a mobile unit from uh, Motor Vehicle Services providing uh, Madison residents and neighboring uh, people with the opportunity to get their license or real ID without having to go to an agency. And the slots filled up quickly, so hopefully we'll be able to bring them back again next year. And a big shout out to uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. While it was the TNEC campus that pulled the David versus uh, Goliath upset, Madison did get uh, mentioned during the second round game against uh, Florida Atlantic. And when you consider that uh, FAU is in the final four, it's even more impressive when you consider that FDU gave them a run for their money. Of course, the, that game blew up my bracket and certainly uh, got Jim Burnett stopped wearing his Purdue vest <laughs> next day. That was, that was there. And I'm going to present a proclamation with our Monarch Pledge Day. So I ask uh, Deborah McDonough, McDonough to come up and Bridget Daly. This is Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day, March 27, 2023. Whereas a monarch butterfly is an iconic North American species whose multi-generational migration and metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly has captured the imagination of millions of Americans. And whereas both the Western and Eastern monarch populations have seen drastic declines due to their habitat loss, pesticide usage, and climate change. And whereas Madison recognizes that the monarch butterfly, like many pollinators, will only lay eggs on specific host plants, in this case, milkweed. And the monarch caterpillars feed only on milkweed. And whereas monarchs and their food sources contribute to biodiversity, which is crucial to the well-functioning ecosystems on which we depend on for food production, healthy soil, stormwater control, air, air quality, and healthy connections between humans and wildlife, and whereas cities, towns, and counties have a critical role to play to help save the monarch butterfly, and Madison is striving to become a leader. And whereas last month I signed the National Wildlife Federation Mayor's Monarch Pledge and have officially committed to taking meaningful action to protect the monarch butterfly. And whereas Madison's Environmental Commission, Community Garden Advisory Committee, Open Space, Recreation, Historic Preservation Advisory Committee, Garden Club of Madison, Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee, Board of Education, Downtown Development Commission have committed to communication, education, support of community events to plant monarch gardens at home and throughout Madison, including native plant giveaways. Whereas every resident, property owner, and municipal entity of Madison can make a difference for the monarch by planting native milkweed and nectar plants to provide a habitat for the monarch and other pollinators in locations where people live, work, learn, and play, and worship. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, Mayor of Borough Madison, on behalf of the governing body, do you hereby proclaim March 27, 2023, as Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day in Madison, encourage all residents to participate in communication, community activities that support and celebrate monarch butterfly conservation. Thank you. I do, yeah. I can just say um, a couple things for anyone who is interested in um, seeing uh, pollinator habitat here in Madison. First and foremost, the best place to go is the Drew Forest and its Zuck Arboretum, which is a regionally important biodiversity hotspot thanks to more than 14 years of ongoing restoration work. Uh, and there are a number of other uh, pollinator habitats in town. You can go to Madison's new Supporting Pollinators Resources page at sustainablemadisonnj.org, supporting-pollinators. And if you would like to add 
uh, plants, native plants, to where you live or work to uh, support monarch butterflies and other pollinators. There's a native plant sale online April 3rd to 28th with pickup in my yard on May 6th. Um, and 16 uh, towns, including Madison, are participating. Uh, for information, go to greatswamp.org and click on native plants. And then also attend Madison Green and Clean on Saturday, April 29th. That's the reimagined version of our former May Day um, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. where you can buy plants and <coughs> seeds from Toadshade Wildflower Farm and also learn from uh, a variety of different uh, organizations about native plants. <laughs> Thank you so much for your work and education and the commitment from all of Madison too. Thank you. All right, we now move on to reports from committees, community affairs, Council President Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Downtown Development Commission will hold its next meeting on Thursday, April 16th at 7.15 in the Hartley Dodge Memorial Building, Committee Room, second floor. The public is invited to attend, as always. May Day is now called the Madison Green and Clean. It will take place on Saturday, September, uh, April 29th from 9 a.m. to 2 or 3 p.m. The event will be relatively similar but we will enhance the format to focus on environmental and green initiatives. Volunteers and sponsors are needed for this event. Please email ddc at rosenet.org for more information. Two businesses uh, in New Madison, in Madison. The Madison Cheese Shop in the Cook Plaza Alleyway is now open for business. And Rocco's, we have mixed feelings about that, is under new ownership and will now be called for Maggio Pizza, they will open soon. From the Chamber of Commerce, the Easter Fun Fest is Saturday, April 1st from 11.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. Visit the Easter Bunny and guess the number of jelly beans for a chance to win prizes donated by local businesses. The 2023 Madison Taste of Madison is Monday, April 24th at Brooklake Country Club. Tickets are available for pre-purchase at Gary's Wine and Marketplace or garyswine.com. Ladies Night is scheduled for Thursday, May 11th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. From the Command of the Community Center. The Don't Close Your Eyes, Ukrainian Artists Respond to the War Exhibit is in its final week, closing Sunday, April 2nd. Three related events remain on March 29th at 7.30 Madison resident Yana Kane will read her translations of poems she receives almost weekly from established poets in, in Ukraine. On April 1st at 8 p.m., the Summit Film Festival will present an award-winning documentary on the war in Ukraine, Julie Blue, by American, Ukrainian-American filmmaker Roxy Taparovich. And on April 2nd at 4 p.m., Ukrainian pianist and Madison resident Larissa Maliotina will perform a piano concert along with Ukrainian dancer Oksana Harban. Next up on the gallery walls is jazz shots, photos taken by professional photographer Patrick Hillary of prominent jazz musicians in rehearsal and performance. The exhibits will run from until May 7th. Hours are posted on the Arts Center landing page on the MACA website. Six films, including three award-nominated documentaries and three first-run Oscar-nominated features, will be presented in collaboration with the Film Society of Summit. The public is welcome to all showings, a 2 p.m. showing on April 17th of The Power of the Community, How One Town Stood Against Domestic Violence, is particularly interested. The afternoon will include this panel discussion with Kim Cleary, clinician and outreach coordinator for Rachel Coalition, and the film's director, Marky Hancock. Information can be found on the Art Center landing webpage of the MACA website. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you. And just a uh, follow up on your Taste of Madison announcement that um, we, uh, since that is on the 24th, which is the night of a council meeting, we are moving the council meeting that week to that Wednesday, the 26th. So uh, all residents and council members will be able to enjoy the taste without having to worry about being here. And we'll, you'll hear that date also announced when we talk about the budget hearing. And now for uh, Public Works and Engineering and Finance and Borough Clerk, Ms. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to start with uh, Finance and Borough Clerk. The Purchasing Department has a report on a once-a-year large payment on the voucher list that was actually included on the register for March 13th at the last meeting, but I omitted this section from my report, which was already quite long. Um, so just an update on that, that payment. In Madison, the larger apartment and condominium complexes like General Wayne, Rolling Hills Court, and the Madison Commons pay full property taxes, but they do not get full services from the town. They typically have private companies that plow their roads and pick up their garbage. State statute permits that these property owners get reimbursed for certain expenses. So the complexes submit all of their paperwork to Stacy Dooley in the purchasing department, and she calculates the payments. The complexes do not get reimbursed for their expenses at their cost, but instead they get reimbursed at the borough rate. So for example, the per unit reimbursement rate for garbage removal and disposal for a resident in Madison is $128.39. So in General Wayne's case, they submitted $23,606 in garbage costs, and they have 97 units. So the borough reimbursed them $12,000 $12,453. We had over $124,000 in annual reimbursements going out on the March 13th bill list to the condo and apartment complexes. So special thanks to Stacy for working on this important annual project and doing all of the math that is involved for these complex reimbursements. The administration reports that this evening uh, we have three important steps that we need to take as we near the end of the budget process. First, tonight we are introducing Ordinance 21-2023, which is an ordinance to establish a cap bank. The state of New Jersey issued two laws that limit municipal spending. The first is a levy cap, which limits our tax increase to 2%, but there are certain exceptions, such as increases in capital. The second cap is the appropriations cap, which limits the increase in appropriations to a certain amount. However, if the borough passes an ordinance, budget appropriations could increase by 3.5%, with the difference being placed in a cap bank. The cap bank holds two years of excess appropriations in it. Doing this gives flexibility to future councils should there be a sudden and significant increase in expenses, such as, for example, rock salt, vehicle fuels, or piped gas to buildings and other similar purchases. Ordinance 21-2023 will establish that appropriations cap bank, and we will be voting to introduce that ordinance tonight. The second important step we are taking this evening is the introduction of the official budget document. Up till now, we have had six budget discussions and presentations during public council meetings. This process has been very transparent with all presentations on Rosenet and all discussions available for viewing on the Borough Video Streaming Channel. This year's budget includes a 2% property tax increase, which is the equivalent of about $5 a month increase for the average home. Resolution 108-2023 will record our vote to introduce the budget tonight. Once the budget is introduced, state law mandates that it be available for public viewing for at least 28 days. This document will be on Rosenet. It will also be available at the library and in the clerk's office. Then the council will vote to adopt the budget at the council meeting on Wednesday, April 26th. As the mayor noted, we are moving to a Wednesday that week due to Taste of Madison. The third budget item this evening is Resolution 115-2023. This permits so-called self-examination of the budget document. New Jersey statute mandates that all municipal budgets be reviewed annually. However, fiscally strong and prudent towns like Madison are permitted to be reviewed once every three years. As a reminder, last year we were under a state review, and so this year we are allowed to self-certify or self-examine the budget. This helps us make our budget process easier, and it frees up state resources so they can focus on more challenged municipalities. 
Finally, I'd like to end this report by thanking all the staff involved in this budget process, including all the department heads who've come to the council to make excellent and information-rich presentations to the council and the public. And I want to thank my council colleagues for their insights, questions, and comments. I think we've had um, a series of really informative meetings and uh, had a lot of participation, so thanks to everyone. Okay, I'm no moving on now to engineering. I have some, a couple brief capital project updates. Memorial Park footbridge repairs, long awaited, will begin this week with repair work anticipated to be complete within two weeks. And then separately, a pre-construction meeting with the selected contractor for the Memorial Park trail construction project will take place this week. We have some public uh, bid openings coming up for the sewer lining project. The public bid opening will be tomorrow, the 28th at 11 a.m. in the courtroom. And for uh, roof repairs to the utility building, the public bid opening will be tomorrow, also um, March 28th at 10 a.m. in the courtroom. And we have two projects that were advertised for bidding. The Cook Avenue parking lot project was advertised for bidding on March 16th. And the MRC basketball pickleball court was advertised for on March 23rd. Both of those will have bid openings scheduled for the first week of May. And finally, from Public Works, the Parks Department is working <clears throat> with the Recreation Director on getting our fields ready and prepped for spring sports. Um, I'll note that DPW received several very positive messages of appreciation for their diligent work in preparing the Dodge Field uh, ball field for play last week, so thanks to them for their hard work. The interior improvements at the Lucy D field bathroom have been completed, and downtown all benches have been put out as we anticipate the arrival of warm weather. And finally, as part of an ongoing project, the sewer department is installing stormwater grates around town to lessen the amount of debris that makes our, its way into our waterways. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Utilities, Mr. Landrigan. Thank you, Mayor. From the Electric Department, on Wednesday, March 15th at approximately 12 noon, a resident's tree broke in, during the windstorm and fell on JCP&L's feeder line for the Kings Road substation, causing the line to trip and six, about 6,000 customers being without electricity, including Borough Hall, for about 17 minutes. The department removed the tree and then asked JCPNL to re-energize the line. On Monday, March 20th, a garbage truck backed into a pole on Spring Guard Drive and split the pole in half. The crew did a great job replacing the pole and transferring all utilities. The Electric Department would like to thank the Fire Department for providing CPR training on Wednesday, March 22nd. And finally, the, the Department has been busy replacing aging poles at several new construction sites and upgrading the street lights to LED. For the Water Department, Valve Tech, an outside contractor, will be finishing up for the year operating the storm water, the water main valves at intersections according, according to the Water Accountability Act for the Department of Environmental Protection. If you experience discolored water, please let your outside faucet run until the water is clear. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public safety, Mr. Range. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. From the Police Department, on Monday, March 13th, several members of the police department, along with members of our community relations unit, attended No Room for Racism meeting held at the Madison First Baptist Church. The meeting included meaningful conversation on how to unite against hateful language in our community and in our schools. We are proud to stand along with our residents and have an open dialogue to better our community. We look forward to the next meeting. On Saturday, March 18th, members of the Madison Police attended the First Baptist Church Italian Dinner run by church members along with our chaplain, Reverend Dunn. Uh, it was a great event. And on March 21st, Madison Police Headquarters underwent a security inspection by Ronan Security Solutions. The inspection was to ensure compliance with the State Department of Correction guidelines and included the inspection of our detention and holding facilities. Needless to say, our facility was in full compliance and we passed with flying colors. And there is no report from the fire chief tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And health, Mr. Harlan Poudis. I know the drill. You know, before I say something about the Board of Health Mayor, I, I just saw some news come across my computer about another mass shooting in Texas. And I, I you know, I don't know what to say anymore. But killed 19 children. It's just an abomination of where our values are and how we're giving so much priority to the bad people who get 
these weapons of mass destruction. And you know I always have an issue with that. I've been in front of the council on that side of the room. So, you know, we luckily we have more sanity here, but uh, I guess we should all pray that this maybe is the last time and there's some change in this country. Well, that's the second one today, so. That's the second one? Yeah, there was one in Nashville. So uh, I just saw also one in Texas. Yeah, so if there's also one in Texas just now, that uh, would be number two for the day. Oh, wow. What a shame. Sorry to bring down the meeting. Well, I have good news for the Board of Health, so. <laughs> um, the Board of Health was able to get a grant fund uh, through the office of uh, the Bloomfield health, health officials. We acquired a grant that is allowing us to buy some equipment for the Madison Health Department and the EMS. Uh, we consulted with the EMS to see what was required and what would fit their needs. Um, the following items were approved under the grant. We haven't bought them yet, but we have the green light to buy them. Uh, we received an instructor kit which includes the equipment needed to teach adults and adult and infant first aid, CPR, and AED to class sizes of up to eight. Um, we got eight sets of adult AED trainer replacement pads with gel adhesive backing, eight adult disposable bag valve masks, and which are resuscitators, eight disposable ba bag valve masks for infants, four power heart, power heart G5 AED training pads, cardiac science power heart G5 trainer, and 12 BLS and, and manuals. Um, so that's, I mean, I'm sorry I mispronounced some of those uh, items, but uh, I think that's something that's gonna help the borough to offer some good training to residents and uh, also some of our public servants. Environmentally, we're working with the borough to plan for the electrical system maintenance that's planned for the spring. So the, there's gonna be outages around town potentially, briefly, that will require special attention for effective retail food establishments. So the health department has to be involved to instruct them and make sure that they can protect whatever might be perishable there. And uh, from the nursing staff in uh, the borough's uh, health office, there's a free blood pressure screening on April 21st for anybody who wants to come and check their blood pressure. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Now we move on to communications and petitions. Uh, none received, Mayor. All right, now we're on to the first of two uh, invitations for public comment. This one is limited to items on our agenda discussion list and also uh, the resolutions that are listed. So I will go through those. If you want to comment on any other topic, we have our second comment period later in the meeting. The um, discussion item is um, the department head presentation uh, for director of I IT. And these are the resolutions you may comment on. Uh, resolution 108, which is outside of the uh, consent, is the resolution adopting the 2023 budget and tax resolution as uh, outlined by Councilwoman Ehrlich. And these are the other ones that uh, you may comment on, Resolu and these will be part of the consent agenda. Resolution 109, appointing Marisol Casado to position of Deputy Clerk Administrator, uh, annual salary of 53000 Resolution uh, 110, approving temporary signs for Madison Education Foundation 5K race. This is from April 17th to May 28th. May 8th, rather. Uh, resolution 111 is authorizing release of performance guarantee for Park Valley, Valley Madison LLC on um, Lot 1501, Lot 4, which is the four community place. Um, this is a bond of 196000 It will be replaced with a $7,500 bond just to cover the landscaping. Resolution 112 is authorizing shared service agreement with a Borough of New Providence provide courtesy construction inspection services. Resolution 113, approving contract award to Northeast Products for on-site log and brush grinding services in the amount of $4,912 per day. Resolution 114 is appointing Heather Prokop and Marlene Mendoza to the temporary part-time position of Deputy Clerk Administrator. 
uh, resolution 115 is self-examination of the budget resolution as outlined by Councilwoman Ehrlich. Resolution 116 is renewal of memorandum understanding of the Borough of Chatham for styrofoam and food waste recycling. We accept their, uh, they can sign up for the Java program along with drop-off styrofoam and our residents, keep this in mind, uh, have access to free compost and mulch at the um, Milton Avenue yard. Resolution 117 is approving raffle license application submitted by the Knights of Columbus Council 2248. Resolution 118 is authorizing renewal agreement of, for internet provider services NJ Edge. Um, Madison Board of Education is continuing their funding par participation 80% of the total contract costs and um, our authorization is based on the Board of Ed's participation since they use most of that pipeline. So you may comment on those resolutions, which it does include the budget, or the IT uh, presentation. Anyone wishing to co comment on those things, please step forward. And when you step up the le lectern, set, state your name and address, write the same on the clipboard, and try to keep your comments three minutes, but we will give you a one minute grace period. Anyone wishing to speak, please step forward. Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. And we, know, we now go on to the introduction of the 2023 budget and tax resolution. And we start with the uh, CAPBAC Bank Ordinance. I call up Ordinance 21-2023 for first reading. Ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Okay. Ordinance 21-2023, calendar year 2023, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriations limit and to establish a cap bank. Second. Any council discussion? Tom. So, the goal of this is that if we want to have a tax increase in a particular year, we can go up to three and a half percent in lieu of the two percent. It gives us a cushion in case. Uh, yep. Right. Are we planning on using that? We have. We've, I, have I have been here for uh, mm -hmm. 18 years, and I don't. I think we have played it. Safe, uh, Jim can answer. This is the appropriations cap, Mayor, so we can have a 2% tax increase but still have 3.5% increase in appropriations because we use other municipal funding sources to pay for it. So this is the this gives flexibility in the appropriations side, which we actually needed right. a little bit this year given the fact that we did have a lot of prices um, going up this year. So it just caps or it just banks some excess uh, that, we, that we've generated over the last two years in case we need it next year or the year after. Right, we're not actually asking this from the residents. Oh, no, no, oh, no, no. This is just, we could have increased appropriations this much, we only increased them this much, therefore we're gonna take this difference and put it in a bank just in case we need to increase appropriations more next year. And increasing the appropriations does not mean it's an increase in taxes. Right, but it's available, but it can't be touched until? It's uh, during the budget time. That's it. Every year during the budget time. All right. Okay. It's for the discussion. Roll call vote, please. Uh, Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Lampoutis? Yes. Okay, budget introduction. Read the, we'll read the statement and okay. then we'll. Yes. Upon introduction and adoption, the 2023 budget and tax resolution will be published by summary in the Madison Eagle on March uh, 30th, 2023, with a public hearing date set for Wednesday, April the 26th, 2023 at 8 p.m., at which time and place all interested individuals will have an opportunity to be heard and there will be consideration for final adoption. A copy of the budget as introduced will be filed in the Madison Public Library and the Morris County Library and posted on the borough's website for public viewing. At uh, resolution 108, we'll uh, move the resolution and then we'll uh, have an update as part of the discussion on uh, changes. Mayor, I move resolution 108 2023. Second. Second. Jim, why don't you start with uh, some of the uh, changes? Sure. Um, there were a few changes, Mayor Michael, if you advance to the next slide. Uh, there were a few changes that are noted on the, um, the side here. We had an extra grant come in. We had an increase in state aid. 
and um, we decided to increase the amount of money we're appropriating for the Madison Chatham Joint Meeting. We may not need that money, but if we had a true up next year and depending on um, expenses and the Madison Chatham Joint Meeting hasn't really resolved and finalized their budget, we thought it prudent to do that. In order to uh, fund that appropriation, we increased the amount uh, that we're anticipating in interest to income. Either way, they will likely fall to fund balance. If we didn't do this and we had interest income higher than anticipated, it would go to fund balance. If we don't spend this money that's appropriated to the Madison Chatham Joint Meeting, it goes to fund balance. But this just makes sure we have enough money because that budget has not been resolved yet. I think it's a uh, good plan. There's uh, you know two things that affect our costs to the joint meeting. One is the direct costs, and the chemicals and other things have been greatly increased uh, over the last couple of years, and so that's a big exposure. The other is the metered flow and uh, as it's trending right now, it has trended back towards Madison, and so that's a, an adjustment also. So it could be a, a, a two parts. So I think it's very important. To put Correct. You can see the increase here in 2019 of 1.1 $1 .1 million, and now we're at almost 1.5 million. That's a, that's more than two percent increase every year, and that's a good example of how we need Cap Bank because there's some expenses that go up by more than two or three percent. Anything else to share or any questions or comments from the uh, council? Um? I'm sorry? The mayor's the boss. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know about that. Just collaborator. So, so on this budget, Jim, do you show the interest that we're earning from the cash that we have in the bank in the money markets? Yes, it is reflected in municipal revenue sources line B1. We anticipated very little in 2022 because there was almost no interest income. We increased it significantly this year. Uh, we don't really know what interest rates are going to be like in three months or six months. It certainly looks like we're going to generate, um, generate excess revenue. If we do, it doesn't get spent on party hats or anything else like that, it ends up going to fund balance. And if you look at bit line B1, prior year municipal fund balance, we have increased that a significant amount from 5 million to 5.9 million. So we need to generate fund balance next year to be able to pay hopefully 5.9 million in fund balance. So, uh, so, so where you know, we're that? being conservative on, a, on what we're anticipating on the interest income. Where is that, Jim? That's, that's B2? That's part of B2. So you're anticipating $500,000 from not just that or from just that? No, so B2 is, is license fees. It's fees that the clerk generates. It's construction code fees. Mm -hmm. It's a number of lines that are in there that represent it, and interest income is a significant one. Right. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, and then... Uh, is there anywhere where we might, we have rateables. There's one section here for rateables, right? So it doesn't show any figure yet. Oh, it shows $51,000 before. Yep. That's property tax, that's new rateables. So, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, does that take into account when the community place apartment building starts paying taxes and, um, the new building that just went up on Waverly Place, the bank, Investors Bank, is probably going to be paying a lot more in taxes since they added two floors. Uh, there's a lot of new, some new construction homes that maybe will triple property taxes on those properties. So, so think of that number there, that additional rateable number, uh, which is where is it? Bear with me. B3. Think of that number as stuff that's already happened. CO has been issued, building is open. If you've got a building that, is, that was still under construction and didn't get completed towards the end of last year, it's not on our books to fully tax it this year. So the theater, I don't, they're really moving on the theater now. Is anybody doing yeah, by there lately? Finally. It's really, it's, it's above 
yeah. sea level now. Yeah. Um, so uh, a building like that, a building like the building you mentioned, the old Crestmont Savings Building, the Investors Bank Building, that building there is not CO'd and not ready. People haven't moved in. So that will help us next year, right? That, no, right. that number will be reflected in the new rateables next year. Okay. And we have to wait until they're CO'd and a certificate of occupancy until there's a certificate of occupancy until the um, actual appraised value has been determined by our assessor and it's on the books. I keep looking at Bob Landrigan because he does this for a living. But so that is this just a conservative estimate, fifty one thousand six hundred? No, that is actual additional revenue from actu the net rateable change. So at the end of the year, our assessor files a form that includes the amount of new rateables in it, and it also uh, includes any loss in rateable. There's, there may be negotiated uh, reductions in property taxes. So that amount represents the fact that there is, let's see, every, so uh, $20,000 is about a million dollars of net increase in, in value of a rateable. Mm -hmm. So we probably have about two and a half million dollars increase net. Now, we definitely had more construction, yeah. right? Yeah. But as we've talked about over the last six months, and I'm looking at Bob Landing again, we've negotiated, had to negotiate the reduction of office space um, properties significantly. So when you have a, an office space that has a, a reduction of $8 million or $10 million in rateables, uh, our $15 million growth in rateables gets netted down to $2.5 million in rateables. Right. But that has to have happened already. Right. And it's happened, not yeah. Not, and not so forecast. all those items have yeah. actually happened, and so this is actual true revenue that will be generated by the net new rateables. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Bob? Yeah, so the bottom line with the way this budget is set up, if it hasn't happened yet, you can't predict that it will happen because that wouldn't be a prudent budget. You have Correct. to be conservative with the way you approach it even with the interest income you know if you didn't make a lot of interest income in 21 you can't say you're going to make that same interest you know you're going to make 10 times that much in 22 because that would be dangerous because you don't know which way it's going to go the state statute actually doesn't even allow you to do it so last year we only anticipated $50,000 worth of income because in 2021 we only generated like $50,000 worth of income. I could be off on that number, but it was a very low number of interest that we generated. And so we have to be conservative there. And I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, you know, uh, doing this budget and doing the finances for the borough is like trying to park a, a, a big cargo freighter, looking at Tom when I'm saying that, and we're allowed to touch the we're allowed to touch the wheel for the first three months, and then we have to sit back and see where we go and see where we park it. So we have to be conservative on the appropriations side. We always um, over-appropriate on rock salt. We sure didn't need a lot this year. We could use a ton next, we may need a ton next year. I've seen situations where rock salt prices tripled because there's been um, you know, supply chain issues. So we're conservative on appropriations, we're conservative on revenues. What happens? It becomes fund balance. When we underspend, or when we, uh, when we underspend or when we under-anticipate revenue or generate more revenue, it becomes fund balance. And, it, and well, like I said, we don't buy party hats. It comes right here into the budget the following year. Can I ask you one more question, Jim? So how come our reserve for un uncollected taxes has grown so much since 2019? I don't think you've had many instances with uncollected taxes. It's $200,000 almost. Good question, Tom. You're, you're asking good questions right. to, to stimulate good Yes, good sir. discussion. So the reserve for uncollected tax, uh, again, we don't know what we're going to collect in tax in any one year. I can look back to 1935, 1940, you know, I'm not saying anything like that's going to happen now, where we had terrible collection of property taxes. So we're conservative on the reserve for uncollected tax. If we overcollect, Christy's done a great job in the last few years collecting since she's become tax collector, collecting taxes at close to 99%, but we anticipate collecting 97% because we just don't know. And anything that we collect over that, again, becomes fund balance. So the fund balance that we have, that $5.9 million, that's a pretty big amount of a $34 million budget. It's generated by three things, the reserve for uncollected tax it's, and, and excellent tax collection. It's generated by um, what I just talked about on, on appropriations and revenues. 
Right, but you just seem to be, we the Boney just seems to be collecting more than we've, like the recession, if that wasn't a time when we actually got hope. There's, act, there's actually a strategic planning guideline, we won't flip to it, but there's a strategic planning guideline that talks about the reserve for uncollected tax and how it should be a certain amount. And if you go the other way, it becomes uh, systemically un unsustainable if you start yeah. deciding to just not do the reserve for uncollected tax or cutting it back significantly. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions or comments? I just want to say a couple things, Mayor. This is a, a budget line that has 35 lines. This is the state budget document that has about 300 lines in it. Then there's the Edmonds budget, which you all used to see, which is a book this thick, which has probably 800 or 900 budget lines in it that the that the uh, department heads get to spend. There's a lot of work that goes into this, and I want to recognize Chrissy and Michael for all their help, both with the physical presentation here for Michael and Chrissy with all the numbers. So I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> and to, to uh, reinforce that, your, our residents are welcome to go to the library to see the detail. Go look look at it published in the newspaper but going to the website and seeing it in a much more comprehensive manner is, is a highly recommended direction. That yeah, I think it would take me a couple hours to try to explain this document to, to anybody, even someone who's in the finance industry. It's a little wacky. And just to reinforce that in a what's been a, a difficult stretch with increased costs and health insurance and uh, with ma managing the health insurance uh, increases so we can uh, Bring them down, but still that brought it down to 11 percent instead of 21 percent, and so on. It's all been, been a challenge, and so this is a very strong budget, and uh, you know it reflects the, the work of our staff and council and previous councils. And I appreciate council recognizing that uh, you know slow and steady, small incremental increases in property taxes. Nobody likes their. I, I'm, in property in town, nobody likes their property taxes increased, but if we sat there and did, did zeros over and over and over again, we would be in a whole heap of trouble, especially when you look at some of these costs that have gone up, health insurance up 11%, um, attorneys uh, going up significantly, um, sewage treatment processing going up by 11%. We have to pay the bills, and unfortunately, as you said, the costs are going up. All right, roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Lampoutis? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Well done. Thank Mr. you. Thank you for being here and all your work. We now move on to agenda discussions. And this is, um, you know, during the budget process, we've uh, we had different department heads present uh, their successes and goals for the coming years. And so this is continuing that process with Jim Sanderson with our information technology. Jim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to present. Oh, there we are. Would you advance the slide, please? Um, we're pretty straightforward. The first entry is special services, which is not really very informing. Um, that's the biggest increase from last year. Uh, special services covers, excuse me, software licensing, subscriptions to various um, web services. Um, also, uh, professional services. Um, we also use that account to pay for our um, desktop support personnel which is a service we share with five other municipalities. Uh, so we get reimbursed 150000 on that outlay of 225. So some of that money comes back to us. Um, also, we're using this to uh, pay for our cybersecurity program, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. <coughs> equipment, maintenance of equipment, those lines are unchanged from last year. and. Equipment basically refers to slightly more expensive stuff. Servers, networking hardware, computer hardware. Office supplies, um, we buy desktop computers, we buy monitors, printers, cables, and other smaller items. Um, I would say two, $3,000 would be about the threshold of what I would call 
office supplies. Uh, the tablets, for example, would qualify as an office supply. Uh, books, publications, travel and training. Um, these are just placeholders, really. And uh, the telephone expenses also includes um, connectivity charges for a number of the tablets used across the town. So that's not just my personal phone, because that would be egregious. Um, would you advance the slide, please? Uh, <clears throat> I'll say very briefly, we have, because of our enhanced security efforts, we learned that um, our email server had been compromised last summer, which was a strong motivation, motiv should I not? Strong motivation for us to move our email to the cloud. And um, that incurs an additional cost. It was a real jump through hoops to get it done quickly. Uh, we have done that, and now all of the email is on the cloud. Excitingly, we're using Office 365 uh, full suite for a growing number of department heads around the borough. And um, I got a really exciting call two weeks ago from the electrical utility. They have a database of all the utility poles in town. And they realized that they could utilize Office 365 to make uh, that database available to the foreman out in the field real time so that as they make changes to polls, they can update that database without having to come back to the shop and log in and, and make changes. So I thought that was very good. Also part of our security uh, enhancements this past uh, year, uh, we have a new uh, edge security, what used to be called antivirus software. We're using a program called Carbon Black with active monitoring. So we're contracting with a firm whose name is, oddly enough, Deep Sea, and they're letting us know whenever we uh, have any hits on our antivirus software. So we're staying very much on top of what's going on with any intrusion. Additionally, we have um, contracted with our internet service provider, NJ Edge, for a virtual chief information security officer. Uh, the virtual chief information security officer is only um, I meet with her once a week, virtually, and we discuss matters. She's helping me with our uh, compliance with the GIF, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, she was instrumental in helping us uh, chase down things that we found. We're doing a lot more with security scanning of internet traffic in and out. Uh, that advanced scanning is, is expensive, but uh, it revealed the compromise of the mail server. Um, and because of the level of detail that we're getting, we were able to identify the exact specific computers on our shared network um, that, were, that were infected, and we were able to isolate them quickly. Um, so we did not have a bad thing happen. So that uh, worked out in the long run. The next point on this achievement list is a revised technology plan that will bring us in full compliance with the uh, mutual, uh, municipal excess liability joint insurance funds requirements. Uh, we can tell them up front that we're in compliance, but of course what really matters is in the event of a claim of an incident, their, their analysis after the fact, has got to hold up um, for them to actually fully cover us. Um, we're putting new firewalls in. Uh, we're going to actually deploy and uh, implement them on Good Friday so that we don't interfere with uh, daily operations. Uh, that's going to give us a separate firewall from the school district so that we'll have direct control of our own firewall which I think is going to be very helpful. I mentioned, of course, the technology support for the five municipalities. Um, another security um, initiative we rolled out this summer was um, multi-factor authentication on logins. Uh, that's true for more than 90% of the computers and personnel across the borough. 
Uh, anyone, connect, anyone logging into a borough computer needs multi-factor authentication. That uh, result is should someone's email, uh, should someone's network password be compromised, a bad actor could not simply log in remotely because that computer that they would be trying to log in on requires multi-factor authentication. And then um, another factor that was adopted largely for the purpose of security was moving our major applications up to the cloud. We initially moved um, spatial data logic, which is a program used by primarily the uh, building department, but other departments as well make use of this for a wide array of information keeping about assets across the borough. Uh, the Edmonds uh, accounting system is now up on the cloud, and we'll be moving our utility billing very shortly up onto the cloud. The significance of this is in the event of a ransomware attack, we would not be dependent upon our local network for these key applications. So the operation of the borough could continue even with our computers compromised. Uh, the second half of this uh, solution will be the acquisition of a number of uh, laptops that we're going to hold in reserve whose purpose will simply be to connect to the internet and run cloud applications in the event of a catastrophe. So we're, we're cleaning up our incident response. Um, incident response plans are challenging because it's just like handicapped uh, facilities. No one size fits all. They all are dependent upon the specifics of the incident or the handicap. And um, we're, we're, we're trying to guess what problems we have to prepare for. So that's where we stand. Would you advance the slide, please? So we had hoped last year to update the networking hardware, but the, uh, the issues with network security bumped that project. So we're going to try and take care of that this coming year. We're going to improve network uh, employee training with a focus on cybersecurity. Uh, we're going to move more borough programs up to the cloud. Um, we're also going to be moving more of the borough's documents up to the cloud to make them more shareable, uh, particularly with people who are not uh, working at a desk. I mean, it's so easy to think in terms of people being at their desk all the time, and yet there's quite a few employees who simply are not. Um, I made a note to increase utilization of computing assets across the borough. An example of that would be the project with the electrical utility and their utility poles. And then, of course, getting the certification with the uh, joint insurance fund. I also put an agenda recommendation in to continue with our ISP and J Edge. Our three-year agreement ends in August. Uh, their new agreement doubles our bandwidth and cuts the price by 45%. So we've shared that information with the school district. The school district pays the lion's share of the bill and utilizes the lion's share of the bandwidth. So we'll be up to two gigabits per second up and down with the borough having a guaranteed 50 megabits per second, no matter what the load is on the school district. Any questions, please? or comments? Uh, Eric and then Tom. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm glad to see several of these things. As you know, I've been a long advocate of some of these things, so appreciate the work, particularly on Microsoft 365 and multi-factor authentication. Um, for the outstanding employees, so we, you noted about 90% are currently using multi-factor. When do we think the last the last hurrah will be for soon. Yeah. The dilemma remains we have people who are not at the desk all the time. Mm -hmm. We have shared computers, particularly in the um, building department, where multiple inspectors use the same machine. If we apply the Cisco Duo to that computer, no one will be able to log in on it until they've been set up. So getting them all together, getting them all set up has been a bit of a dance. And 
we are prioritizing operations over security simply because things have to work. Okay, fair enough. Um, and once we complete that, is there any um, consideration to deploying or expanding uh, Duo and requiring a univer or university or uh, university a municipal uh, requirement for multi-factor authentication on the 365 logins? I'm disinclined. I've heard problems with uh, implementing the multi-factor authentication on Office 365 itself. I'm more concerned about people uh, who can actually get into our assets. Uh, the Office 365 is in the cloud. I, I realize that that doesn't mean it's safe by any stretch of the imagination. I, I like to tell people that uh, when it comes to cloud assets, it's like renting warehouse space. You, it's you, just someone else's hard drive. <laughs> right. yeah. you're, you're renting the space. They don't give you a complete security system. That's up to you to supply. Um, but I, I, I'm really anxious about locking people out of their email or their documents. So I want to go slowly asking more of our users. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, Thanks, Jim. You know what Eric says. Thanks, Jim. I, I know you got a good handle on security, and that's it's a, so important in businesses and obviously in the public sector. So this budget that you have here of 393000 is that similar to last year? I, I didn't... Oh, uh, that is an increase of exactly 50000 all on special services, all due to moving Office 365 uh, up to the cloud, which incurs extra expense, and the added costs of the enhanced security subscriptions we have, uh, the, monitor, the uh, dark right. web monitoring and such. Right. So, the, so the special services budget is increasing, but the other ones are similar last Unchanged. year? And did, did, you, did you spend all that money last year? Uh, most of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't spend down my budgets unnecessarily. Yeah, I was just curious. Everything's round numbers, so I don't know exactly where your costs actually fell. But, uh, okay, I'm, I'm sure you're responsible about it. I know you from seeing you work in the past. The, on, on, on the next slide, uh, you have something here that says you delivered technology support for five remote municipalities. Is that a service that we provide as a courtesy? No, or was it was it's available. Oh, so how About 150000 on it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So that brings your budget down? Or does that just go to general fund? Well, that, that goes into, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but that goes into general fund. But, yep. But, but the, the net exposure is brought down. Yeah. Okay. What? Where does it say that? Oh, on the previous slide? Yeah. I can't read all that detail. <laughs> That's too much. Well, we tried okay. to make it confusing, so we hear you did. all that information. Thank you, sir. Okay. The last thing is, um, so your new, your new firewalls and security measures, is that going to affect how the tenants, uh, the tenants, the residents, tenants, <laughs> it was a landlord, right? <laughs> As residents use the, the RoseNet website to pay bills or anything, they won't see any difference. The RoseNet website is not locally hosted anymore. Yeah. It's remotely it's already hosted, so it has no bearing on what the uh, residents see. Mm -hmm. It will impact what the employees see. Right. But um, hopefully it'll be completely transparent to them. Right. So like as an example, last year when you said we had a little breach, the breach could have been that somebody couldn't got, could have gotten into the records that we have of people who auto pay and have we, their bank We account. did not have that kind of breach. Okay. And then how do you protect against that? I'm sorry? How, how do you protect against that? How do you protect this? <sighs> well, the auto pay doesn't sit locally either. Yeah, invoice cloud is conveniently in the cloud. Yeah, so, so that so we don't need a we don't need a fire or any security yeah. for that for all those services. Okay, that's good. I'm sure some people might have concerned about it. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Anything else, please? All right. Thank you. Thumbs up. Thank, thank you, Jim. Appreciate your doing that update and all your work you do. All right. We now move on to ordinance for hearings. Will the clerk please read the statement? <laughs> 
The ordinances scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed at first reading of the regular meeting of the council held on March the 13th, 2023, were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. Well, of ordinances for second reading, ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title, ordinance 19-2023, excuse me. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Chapter 15 of the Madison Borough Code, entitled Downtown Development Commission. I open the hearing for Ordinance 19. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Here I move uh, Ordinance 19-2023. Second. Again, this uh, amends the ordinance so the members of the um, D DDC, DDC match up with the bylaws and gives us more flexibility right. with appointments. Any further discussion? Mayor, why don't you take off some of the people who, or some of the descriptions of people that were on there, I guess, for forever in the past? Yeah, because they, you know, for example, one was draw the farm representative. Um, we've had difficulty getting someone consistently, and even when we did, they were not necessarily active, and so it gave a, it doesn't prevent us from something. It would be great to have that connection to draw the farms. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't working. There was also the um, seniors, uh, uh, senior, city, c senior Citizen Advisory Committee representative and, and that committee, which will be reactivated, is currently dormant. So. All right. Okay, Mayor. Thank you. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Mr. Serlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 19 2023 adopted and finally passed, and ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 20 2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $30,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund to purchase wiring and other security equipment. I open hearing for Ordinance 20. Anyone who wishes to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 20 2023. Second. Any council discussion? We'll call a vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 20 2023 adopted and finally passed, and ask the clerk to publish notice there of, there of a newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. We are now on to our second of two invitations for public comment. This is when you may comment on any topic, and the same rules apply. When you step to the lectern, please uh, state your name and address. Write the same on the clipboard. Try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we will give you the one-minute grace and stop you at four. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Hi there. Uh, Mary Wilson, 27 Sherwood. Um, just wanted to get some clarification on the solar panel powered carports. Uh, the previous discussions about the solar panel carports at the MRC mentioned generating energy for approximately 25 to 85 homes. Um, and when it was three uh, sites, uh, it, there was mention that it could be about it could reduce approximately 2% of the total town's energy. Um, these are interesting numbers in terms of visualizing what can be produced, but now that the plan is to build one solar panel carport at the MRC, I'm just curious how much is the town's electric bill estimated to be reduced by? Um, is it 25%, 50%? Just curious what that number is. I couldn't find it anywhere online, and um, I think it's important to evaluate the break-even point is for investing in these solar panels. Um, a $2 million project divided by 25 years, which I believe is the life of a solar panel, equals about 80000 a year. Um, also, what is the cost for the carport structure versus the cost of the actual panels? I hope the breakdown will be provided so that we can start to think about the cost of just replacing the panels down the road. Um, also, I um, just wanted to give a shout out to the drive through Recycling Center on Johns Avenue. It was laid out well, labeled well, and um, if you forget to take out your recycling, you can bring it there, I think, Tuesday through Friday, and I highly recommend it. Thank you, Mary. We'll uh, <laughs> cover some of those questions at the end of the comment period, and others we'll, tr we'll try to get back to you on. Mayor, Council, 
Chris DeVivo, Greenwood Avenue, Madison, New Jersey. I want to start off with a quote from Christiana Figueres, Executive Secretary of the UN Convention on Climate Change. The quote's from an interview she gave after the 2015 Paris Agreement. She said, this is the first time in the history of mankind that we are settling ourselves on a task to intentionally, within a defined period of time, change the economic development model that has been reigning for 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. End quote. That model is capitalism. According to the New Jersey Open Meetings Act, public bodies must keep reasonably comprehensive minutes of their meetings at a minimum. The minutes must reflect the time and place, members present, votes, things discussed, and the votes of each member. I could not find any minutes or agendas for the Climate Action Committee. This is in conflict with the law. I'm requesting that the required documents be made available within 30 days. Furthermore, until said documents are available for inspection, I'm asking you to withdraw your resolution and solicit new volunteers that represent a more diverse point of view. According to the most recent available uh, data from uh, the emissions data for Global Atmospheric Research, EDGAR, and our world in data, the U.S. accounts for 15.62% of the world's total energy consumption. Of that, 167 is consumed by all modes of transportation, land, sea, and air. Uh, the rest is agricultural and industrial. Approximately 20% of the U.S. energy production is from renewables. Even the Department of Energy says that uh, wind and solar are not reliable. And, um, that means that the 1,000 new EVs in the committee's recommendations will still use fossil fuels to recharge. At that, and add to that the carbon deficit that those EVs start out with due to fossil fuels in their uh, mining the materials and processing the materials, what are we gaining? At the council meeting in January, the utilities report stated that uh, the energy, the future contracts were going up, and the main push of the CAC is to um, go from this diverse energy profile that we have to a single one, electric only. So are there any other energy providers that can offer better return for the investments? Also at the meeting, the question was asked if our grid was ready, and the answer was we should be. That's really not an answer. So I think this is uh, something that needs to be studied because grid reliability is very important. Um, also, um, finally, my research on uh, gas appliances show that a properly maintained gas appliance is safe. Electric stoves, however, account for more injuries to children than gas stoves, simply because the flames are not visible and it's not always evidence that, that the electric the stove top is hot until it's too late. Also, gas stoves offer more temperature control and electric stoves tend to uh, wear out pots and pans prematurely. One minute. Okay. Uh, with home appliances, as with your choice in automobile, choose whichever is best for you and your family. Give people information, and make, let them make rational and inform, informed decisions, use facts, and not punitive actions against those who exercise choice. And then finally, I'm going to close with a quote from Mark Twain, how easy it is to make people believe a lie and how hard it is to undo that work again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone, anyone else wishing to comment? Kathy Daly, West End Avenue. Um, I'm just going to, I have a couple of comments I wanted to make about the climate action recommendations now that I've had a chance to review them more closely. Um, they were the ones that were presented on, at the February, I think it was the February 13th meeting, if that sounds right, but around that time frame. Um, the first of the recommendations that I wanted to talk about was the one described in section 2.2 where the, uh, the goal and the recommendation is to accelerate residential solar installations. Um, I understand that's going to happen. Residential solar installations are accelerating in, in the rate that they're being um, uh, accept or the rate they're being installed in people's homes. Um, but the, the recommendations themselves only talk about the supportive rate structure, really. Um, for those solar installations to, in, to incent them, um, right? But the section, this section of the report doesn't include any acknowledgement that some, own, some homeowners 
will opt to cut down healthy, mature shade trees in order to maximize the effectiveness or the amount of solar panels that they could put on their home, or even to make it possible in the first place for them to install solar panels and have them generate any electricity for their homes. So my concern here is that the, there's no acknowledgement in that section that shade trees um, should be uh, considered in this equation. Um, there is some reference to the permit process, and um, my suggestion would be that uh, the Climate Action Committee consider um, uh, recognition of shade trees and their importance to the climate too. Um, and this, the second recommendation that I had a comment on was 2.6. Uh, that's the section of, that talks about the tariff revisions to empower customers to manage their electricity use. Specifically, 2.6.1, which talks about the demand side management to help balance the supply and demand. Um, the, I sit on the Utility Advisory Committee um, as one of my volunteer roles here in the community. Um, and one of the, oh, for the Climate Action Committee doesn't seem to be, I know there is some tie in. We have one member of the Climate Action Committee who's on the Utility Advisory Committee. But I just want to make sure there's more of a tie in there because um, this, this section, 2.6.1, of the recommendations talks about and the implementation of varying time of day usage rates so that customers can have an incentive to manage their electric use and help the borough to reduce demand loads on the borough owned grid infrastructure, uh, particularly trying to reduce the demand loads at the peak times when, the, One minute. when it's the most expensive. Um, the Utility Advisory Committee has been talking about the same sort of thing. and. Um, the UAC's goal, though, is slightly different, obviously, than the Climate Action Committee's. Um, the the uh, Utility Advisory Committee's goal is um, to advise you on the utility itself, right? Um, if the borough's, if the, the goal is for the borough uh, to reduce its need to purchase power generation during the peak hours when regional demand is highest and the cost is greatest, the UAC, UAC's approach, the Utility Advisory Committee's approach, at least what we've been discussing, is that the usage rate framework should not be to increase any of rates at all. The, uh, the usage rate framework should um, be aimed at the effect of the efforts, of what we want to do. So since the effect of the efforts should be to reduce the borough costs, our discussions have been focusing on passing the savings that the borough would have onto the customers who most help Time. with uh, achieving those savings. Thank you. Okay, perfect. That those were the end of my comments too. So thank you, Kathy. So we just wanted to share those thoughts. Yep, we appreciate that, and it certainly shows the, the need to uh, coordinate efforts. Anyone else wishing to comment? All right, just a uh, quick uh, follow up um, as we close this part of the meeting. The cost of the uh, solar panels two million. The um, the amount of uh, energy it's providing is, and I, I know you use Hartley Dodge as an example. If, if yeah, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, Thank you, Mayor. The estimate for the solar carport, the total structure, which includes the steel structure and the solar panels, is somewhere in the magnitude of $2 million. Things, prices have been changing, going up and going down um, in, in the solar world. The federal subsidy that we're going to receive is either 600000 or 800000 That will be a direct payment that we receive right after the project is completed. So $2 million minus 800000 leaves $1.2 million left over for the cost of the project. The SREX, which we get from the state, uh, will be about $100,000 a year. So that's $1.5 million because they get paid out over 15 years. So the 800000 and the $1.5 million, this solar carport will, in the end, not cost the borough any dollars um, once all the federal and state subsidies are in. It will generate enough electricity to cover the entire MRC bill. We actually do bill ourselves. The electric utility and the water utility do bill municipal assets. Hartley Dodge pays a water bill. Hartley Dodge pays an electric bill. The MRC carport will cover about 85 homes if you break it down that way. But uh, in reality, what will happen is it will make the uh, MRC bill 
go away to zero, will go to zero. Hartley Dodge's bill would go to zero, and the public safety building will go almost to zero. That's through that net metering that we've talked about in the past. So I don't have the dollar amounts in, in front of me here, but the thought process would be that, those do, that that's kind of a benefit and a reduction in our operating expenses that we have here, which will hopefully allow us to uh, increase capital expending. Because I've said in the past six budget hearings, I'd like to see an increase to get back to the $3.8 million in um, capital spending uh, elsewhere. So I hope that answered the question. Yep, thank you very much. And again, we're being guided by, uh, as was stated in the United Nations uh, most recent climate change uh, report, that the next decade is key to uh, reversing the trends. And the uh -huh. time to act is now and not tomorrow. And yes, we recognize that um, we only control our four square miles. The United States only controls 50 states. But together, we take steps, and hopefully we make a difference in the world. I just want to add one thing, Mayor. Um, the goal of time of use rates is that we'll be talking about them at some upcoming council meetings and net metering, excuse me, and also some other things uh, that are operational that will make it just easier for someone to apply for solar. So it's just uh, kind of the way we manage the application process, putting it online and things like that. So that's some of the climate action goals. So um, those will be coming to council with public discussion on how to uh, advance um, time of use rates. I haven't said this publicly, but I'm kind of changing my mind in it in that I think we should make it voluntary. We'll, we'll have the meter information on customers' bills for a year. Then after that, if people want to go voluntary, if you own an EV, you're absolutely going to want to go with time of use rates. And if you, you want to, you can go to time of use rates. Uh, make it mandated in any way and kind of ease into that brave new world. That sounds good. And there's a comment around the trees. And obviously, if you're removing trees for a panel, you'd have to get a permit. Also, part of the permit process is often, often Looking at the shade, example given years ago as we were looking at tree ordinances, very often someone says, I want to take the tree out because it's, it's shading my pool. And after analysis, it showed, no, it wasn't really the tree was the issue. So the whole same process goes through. And it certainly would be, a, if it's shading solar panels, it's going to be a significant tree, which is guided by our tree ordinance. All right, we now move on to introduction of ordinance. Will the clerk please read the statement? The ordinance is scheduled for first reading. Have a hearing date set for April the 10th, 2023. Will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up ordinances for first reading. I ask the borough clerk to read said ordinance by title, Ordinance 22-2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $55,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of automated license plate readers, security cameras, wiring, and other related security equipment. Mayor, I move Ordinance 22-2023. Uh, Second. Council discussion. Yeah, this is expanding what we have in place already and uh, increasing security. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Lampoutis? Yes. Ordinance 23-2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $50,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of replacement handguns and related equipment for the police department. Mayor, I move Ordinance 23-2023. Second. Any council discussion? Just uh, to clarify, these the current handguns are at their end of life and need to be replaced as per the New Jersey uh, Attorney General guidelines. We'll call for it. Vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Poudis? Yes. Ordinance 24 2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $50,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the 2023 licensed site remediation activities within municipal property. Mayor, I move Ordinance 24 2023. Second. Council discussion? I'll just mention this pertains to, uh, you know, where we have had underground storage tanks and there have been, you know, some cleanup activities related to monitoring the soil where the tanks have been removed, just to clarify a little bit of what this is for. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. 
Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. All right, we move on to consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move uh, approval of resolutions 109-2023, 2018-2023. Second. Any discussion or any that need to be pulled? We'll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. Right, there is no unfinished business. We move on to approve the vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher totals? <clears throat> For the current fund, $4,405,729.81. From the general capital fund, $171,604.60. From the electric operating fund, $475,560.12. From the electric capital fund, $3,201.42. From the water operating fund, $50,767.22. And from the trust, $22,553.95. The total is $5,129,417.12. May I remove approval of the vouchers? Second. Any discussion? Tom? I knew I was going to ask one more question before the night's over. What, what are the trusts? Right. And they earn some money for us. They're all interesting accounts. That's the Jim's creativity. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Land use trusts. Land use trusts for applicants. We have multiple trusts. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Mr. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. Okay, under new business, I'd like to make the following appointment, which requires uh, council consent. And this is for Mary Sue Salco, the governing body appointment to the Madison Housing Authority for unexpired term through August 10th, 2025. So moved. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Tom, you're trying to move for an adjournment. I'll make a motion, Mayor, to adjourn the meeting. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank Second, you for third, joining fourth. us tonight in the audience and those watching at home.